Five years ago, as we've heard, Archbishop Justin uh, launched his attack on payday lending, which was, uh, as we've heard, always, often called the War on Wonga. And tonight is uh, an event where we can celebrate a lot that has come about since then. And over the past five years, so many significant things have happened uh, that we'll hear about later on tonight as well. And there's much to celebrate, and no doubt we will do that this evening. And yet, at the same time, as we've just heard from the Archbishop, the tide is still flowing the other way. 1.5 million people do not have access to a bank account. About 3 million people are in financial distress in our country. Back in 2015, it was estimated that 9 million people were over-indebted and a quarter of the population had savings of less than 500 pounds. 13 million people lacked adequate savings to deal with an income shock. Now, against all of that, we're told that, for example, over the last five years, as a result of the Church Credit Champions Network, two and a half thousand Londoners have joined a credit union, starting to save and having access to responsible and affordable loans. And that's a remarkable achievement and well worth celebrating tonight. And yet, at the same time, we're aware in the light of the, the, light of the scale of the problem, it is just scratching the surface. And so, how do we think about what we're doing in a campaign like the one that the Archbishop launched five years ago. Now, the practice of lending money at interest has always troubled Christians. In the Bible, the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy condemn what they call usury, uh, lending money at interest, uh, outright. And even though the New Testament doesn't really mention it very much at all, the early church was also very negative about any form of loan at interest. Let me take one example. St. Basil the Great was the Bishop of Caesarea in what is now Turkey. And in the fourth century, he was one of the Eastern Church's greatest churchmen and theologians. Not many theologians and people get called great within the Christian Church. I don't think I will ever be called Graham the Great, but St. Basil the Great is one of those who got named in that uh, regard. And in one of his sermons, he condemns the practice of lending at interest unequivocally. It's quite a remarkable sermon, and in it he paints a vivid picture of the psychology of borrowing and lending. And it's worth quoting. He describes how the borrower feels once he gets the loan and the change of emotion as time progresses. I'll describe it for you in his words. After receiving the money on the first day, he is joyful and festive, decked out in borrowed splendor, the change in circumstances in clear evidence. There's a richly laden table and lavish clothing. Even the servants have brightened in their appearance. He's surrounded by multitudes of flatterers and drinking companions, hovering around the house like swarms of drones. But as the money begins to dwindle, the interest ever increasing as time passes, the nights do not bring rest to him, nor does the coming of the day bring joy, nor does the sunrise seem beautiful. Rather, he despises his own life and loathes the days as they hasten onwards towards the appointed day of repayment, and he hates the months as producers of interest. If he lies down in his sleep, he sees the lender as a nightmare floating over his head. If he wakes up, the interest consumes his thoughts and is a constant source of worry. When the lender and the debtor meet each other, one rushes like a hound to the hunt, while the other quails like a quarry at the pursuit. One rejoices at the increasing interest, while the other groans at the additional misfortune. Well, that's a text written in the fourth century, but it describes exactly the emotions experienced by anyone who takes out a loan at high levels of interest today. Payday lending is nothing new, and so Archbishop Justin's campaign against it stands in a long line of Christian protests against abusive economic practices. Now, St. Basil has in mind abusive forms of usury, where rates of interest become impossible to repay. And his attack is on lending money as a way of preying on the poor, taking advantage of their misfortune to make a swift profit for those who already, already have more than they need. The result, of course, is slavery, literally, in Basil's case. And he cites the painful experience of knowing families who have sold their children literally to become slaves, as a result of an inability to make interest repayments. He speaks of those who make the hardships of the miserable an occasion for profit. And he even describes a loan given on interest as a kind of poison that 
slowly destroys those who take out such loans without any full point thought for the future. And he points out the savage irony. With this kind of arrangement, the poor end up paying more and the wealthy, those who already possess capital, end up possessing more. Rather than the rich giving to the poor, the poor end up giving to the rich. And Basil is so convinced of the iniquity of this system of lending on interest that he urges the poor to choose poverty rather than debt. He says even begging is better than borrowing. Now Basil says the essential commandment is love of neighbour. For him, holding on to your possessions when your neighbour needs them is a lack of love. He argues that resources should remain in constant circulation rather than being stored or hoarded. And he reckons this happens through generosity in giving rather than lending at interest. The circulation of capital and the rejection of the practice of the hoarding of goods or money is all in the service of what he calls in a Greek word, apanisoun, a restoration of a balance or equilibrium within society so that everyone can flourish. Now Basil's points and his sermon on usury is a vivid example, but it's common to much early church and medieval attitudes to usury. As you may know, the practice of usury was formally condemned by a number of medieval councils, the Third Lateran Council in 1179, the Second Council of Lyon in 1274. And Martin Luther wrote a lengthy sermon against usury. But it's in the 16th century that we begin to see attitudes begin to change a little bit. Now, this is, of course, the period where capitalism is beginning to emerge from medieval feudal forms of social and economic life. Lending at interest is becoming a standard means uh, of enabling entrepreneurial activity, enab enabling the less well-off to have access to capital, to build their lives and businesses and letting the profits be shared between lender and borrower. It has by now become a primary way of advancing the economy and creating wealth. And so perhaps it's not surprising that in the 16th century we find different approaches to money lending emerging. Now the second major theologian I want to touch on tonight is, after Basil, John Calvin. He wrote a fascinating letter on the practice of usury to one of his friends. Now the approach that Calvin takes tries to balance two things. Unlike Basil, he refuses to outlaw the practice altogether and yet he is deeply aware of its dangers. He argues that there's no clear scriptural passage that bans all lending at interest. And therefore he says, if we totally prohibit the practice of usury, we would restrain consciences more rigidly than God himself. But if we permit it, he goes on, then some under this guise would be content to act with unbridled license, unable to abide any limits. He says that usury normally comes along with two inseparable com companions, radical cruelty and the art of deception. And he says it is rare to find a good man who also practices usury. So on the one hand, Calvin leans towards Basil's dislike of the practice, and yet on the other hand, he points out that Scripture does not explicitly condemn it. And in fact, he says, he argues, that it's unrealistic and probably undesirable to ban the practice altogether. And in turn, Calvin deals with all the normal arguments against usury and concludes that none of them ultimately hold water. He even ex ex advances a few examples where lending money at interest is good for both borrower and lender. He puts the case like this. It would be desirable if usurers were chased from every country, even if the practice were unknown. But since that is impossible, we ought at least to use it for the common good. His position is that usury, a bit like the police or the judiciary, is inevitable and perhaps necessary in a fallen world. And so he wants to keep the use of the practice, but suggesting a number of vital safeguards, which are well worth considering today, among which are the following. Number one. No one, he says, should take interest from the poor. And no one, destitute by virtue of indigence or some affliction or calamity, should be forced into it. Number two, it should be practiced in accordance with the principle of equity. In the light of the teaching of Christ, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Number three, regard should be taken not just for the private interests of the two parties involved, but as he puts it, we should keep in mind what is best for the common good. Now it's interesting that Calvin uses that phrase. 
We are perhaps used to it as a product of Catholic social teaching in more recent times, but it has a longer history than that. Calvin himself appeals a great deal to this idea of the common good. According to Christ's teaching, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. And his teaching echoes Basil's desire for an economic system that enables good circulation of resources, guarding against the hoarding of wealth so that the economy works for the benefit of all. Now, both Basil and Calvin think that in the kingdom of God, there would be more than enough to go round. In the kingdom of God, they would say, when calamity, disaster, or poverty hits one member of society, that lack would be made up by the gifts of another. An equilibrium would be kept through the practice of generosity and love for one's neighbor. Because, they argue, in the kingdom of God, no one is primarily interested in their own fortunes or wealth or bank balance, but they are primarily interested in their neighbor's wealth, poverty, fortunes, or bank balance. Their first and foremost need and desire is to enable that their neighbor is well supplied with what is needed, secure in the knowledge that other neighbors will look after their own needs, and in the knowledge that this world is the creation of a good and lavish God who gives us all that we need and more. However, they both realize that we live in a fallen and not an ideal world. We do not yet live in the kingdom of God. As another of Basil's sermons puts it, the world that forgets God is ruled by injustice towards neighbors and inhumanity towards the weak. They both recognize that the unscrupulous borrower will either feign poverty in order to attract donations from the rich, or similarly unscrupulous lenders will seek to gain the maximum interest possible, preying on the poor and their desperate need for cash by lending money at rates which are going to be impossible to repay. So Calvin in particular recognizes that although in an ideal world, lending would be replaced by giving, in the world we actually live in, some form of lending at interest is necessary and can in some circumstances be beneficial as long as it's hedged around with a number of safeguards that prevent abuse. Calvin believes that lending at interest can be redeemed and it can become a way of serving the common good, of helping the neighbor out of poverty rather than driving him further into it. But he points out that this only happens when those who lend money are governed as their primary consideration, not the need for profit, but the needs of their neighbor. Now, in that context, let me draw attention to two particular points. First, if they are to do as they would be done by, creditors or lenders should lend in a way that they would wish to be lent to, which means putting themselves into the shoes of those who are the recipients of the loan. Money lending can be an arm's length approach to helping. And yet, both in Basel and Calvin, we see a different way one which encourages relationship between lenders and borrowers. Basil's description that I described earlier on of the psychology of lending shows that he knows these people. He knows intimately the experience of those who suffer from the abuse of lending. Calvin's reminder of Jesus' command to do unto others as you would have them to do unto you similarly points to the need to step into the shoes of another so that you can begin to imagine how you would like to be treated if you had hit hard times. As it's sometimes said, the problem is not so much that the rich do not give to the poor, it's that they do not know the poor. As Gust Gustavo G Gutierrez once said, you say you love the poor, well, what are their names? This is why communities such as churches, as brokers of these kind of relationships are so important local communities where the wealthy and the not-so-wealthy can mix and step into each other's shoes. Local churches sponsoring credit unions, offering debt advice, and building relationships between the better off and the worse off are vital to seeking change. And so, for example, local community-based mutuals or credit unions are a really good ethical model of finance providers you can, on the one hand, lend at better rates as they don't have to give a return on capital to shareholders, but on the other hand, they're also able to lend to those on the margins as they can make credit decisions on a knowledge of the individual and their needs rather than using some credit score. Second, 
We need an economy that places the common good above personal or institutional profit as the primary motive in our financial dealings with one another. And we need encouragements for boards and shareholders to act for the common good rather than just the bottom line. But how do we do this? That may seem completely unrealistic. So often our desire to maximize profit comes from fear. Fear that there's not enough to go round. Fear that we will be left out. Fear that we will not be provided for. And so we try to grab as big a slice of the pie as we can. At one point in his argument, St. Basil suggests that Christians should give rather than lend. Or if they do lend, should not ask for interest repayments, nor even to expect necessarily to get back what has been given. And he goes on to say that gifts given to the poor in the name of Christ are in fact a form of loan in that God promises to repay all those who have given up goods for the sake of the kingdom of God. He says this, give away that portion of your silver that is lying idle and do not burden it with interest rates and it shall be well of you both. You will have the certainty that your money is well guarded. The one who receives it will have the profits from its use. If you must seek a return on your investment, be satisfied with what comes from the Lord. He himself will pay the additional amount on behalf of the poor. Now, Basil may be giving a counsel of perfection here, and it may be we need to correct his total ban on usury with Calvin's more measured approach. But what I find in common in both of them is that the God that both Basil and Calvin point us to is a God of liberality and abundance. A God who can be provided, who can be trusted to provide for our needs if we imitate his generosity in giving and lending as he does to each of us. And so in all our thinking about economic matters, we need to keep in the forefronts of our minds, not a theology of scarcity, but a theology of abundance, that we believe in a God of generosity and abundance. Maybe we fear lending at lower interest rates or failing to make the maximum return possible on our investments because we fear that we will lose out. We fear the future so we grab as much as we can for ourselves. If we really believed in a God of liberality and abundance, that would release us from those pressures, release us from those needs, and enable us to be able to establish an economy that works for the common good, the good of everyone, rather than just our own profit. We live in a society where we normally think that we are basically individuals whose responsibility is to seek our own well-being and interest, who need to be persuaded that that, that it's right to curb our own self-interest for the good of other people and to make common cause with others when it seeks our own goals and purposes. That version of libertarian individualism is seen in an extreme form in the payday lenders whose commitment to personal gain is primary. And the urgent need of those who've who've hit on hard times is seen as an opportunity for quick profit rather than a call to generosity. Instead, the Christian vision is of a society where, as St. Paul puts it, each of you looks out not to your own interests but to the interests of others. His vision of a, is, a, is of a society where the primary consideration is how our economic system affects everyone, not just delivers profitability for some, because we are made for relationship. We are made for each other. And we find our fulfillment as individuals precisely in our mutual relationships with one another, which is why this mutuality, this intimate relationship between lenders and borrowers becomes so significant. We may get dispirited by the size of the problem, but the answer to that is not to do nothing, nor to despair over our inability to totally change our way of acting and the foundations of our economy. Instead, it is to do exactly what's been happening over the last five years. To set up signs which which bear witness that there is a better way, a different way of relating, an economy based on the needs of others, on the common good, and a basic ethic of generosity and trust. And I would suggest we see that the campaign that we are celebrating tonight, not only as an act of justice, but as also as an act of witness, pointers to a world which Basil imagines, where there would be no need for interest rates or loans, 
because each would look out for one's neighbour so effectively through generosity that poverty would be a thing of the past. Let me draw this to a close. Lending at interest, although deeply suspected by the Christian tradition, can be redeemed and can become a means of helping the poor and not fleecing them. The kind of changes we are celebrating tonight act as a witness to generosity and kindness rather than making a profit at all costs as the driving force of our life together. We may not yet have a society made up of people so filled with the generosity and faithfulness of God that we can only act towards each other out of generosity and trust, but we can at least argue for practices which point in that direction, that work as far as possible for the benefit of those who need access to finance, to help them arise out of poverty and need, rather than push them further into those twin whirlpools. In our world, there often seems to be a tension between justice and mercy. Justice, which involves punishment and awareness of our tendency to deceive one another, needs to be tempered, on the, on the, on the other hand, with mercy. But on the other hand, I would suggest, in the kingdom of God, justice doesn't need to be tempered with mercy. Justice is mercy. To do justice is to love mercy. It is to ensure that through generosity, through sacrificial self-giving, through lending in a way that doesn't produce the maximum gain for myself, but brings about the well-being of my neighbor, that is justice, that is mercy. Every small triumph that we celebrate tonight <coughs> is an act of witness that points to that different way of living a world where justice and mercy, righteousness and peace kiss each other because they are one. Hi, welcome back everyone as you come. And delighted to welcome Bishop Graham. Let's get going with the questions and then as people join we can continue. But thank you Bishop Graham for joining us. Really yeah. grateful to have, your, have you with us. It's a real, a real treat really. Um, so we've all watched um, the, the talk that you gave us a couple of years ago looking at sort of the the theology of how we borrow and lend and actually what's you know how can we how can we redeem it i think was the phrase that you're using um i don't know whether anyone has questions or thoughts or comments but we'd love to put those to bishop graham what i'm going to suggest is we have two or three together so i think the first question jenny said why doesn't the church rather than lend money give more training sessions i feel that talking about money problems in church is taboo that's the first question um so um does anyone have another f any other questions we want to add as we go and then we'll do it uh, ben um go for um it. yeah my, my question is this um if uh, if i lend my let's say my hedge trimmer to my next door neighbor because they want to trim their hedge all i expect is that my hedge trimmer comes back um in a good condition um i don't expect anything extra to that so why is it that when it comes to money, somehow we feel that there has to be a tariff on top of that. That's another, another good one. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question in the first round to, to put to Bishop Graham or a comment or a, a vehement disagreement? Elizabeth. <laughs> I was struck by the comment that it's not so much that the rich don't give to the poor, but that they don't know them. And I wondered, obviously, there are other parishes here who are, are doing a lot in the way of debt counselling. And how do you start that relationship? There are, there are people in our parish who are poor, but they don't come to our church. So how do we start that dialogue and get yeah. the church seen as a place where you can go for that, for, for advice and help? Is that, is that okay, Graham? Can we start with those three meaty ones? Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, did, just picking up Jenny's question um, about the church lending money or training, I, I think you're absolutely right. I'm not sure the church is a money lender. Um, I'm not sure the church should get into money. We're not a bank. We're not a, um, we're not a hedge fund. We're not anything. You know, I think we should be very aware of getting into that sort of um, um, that level. But we are. Um, but I think excuse me, a lot of churches do. I mean, well, there's an interesting question there about the church commissioners. We could go into that if we wanted to. But um, um, what about some money management? I mean, it's, it's very interesting. I think that has been a growth area in the church in recent years. So Christians Against Poverty, um, the Money Course, there have been various sort of resources that have been produced 
to enable local churches to give uh, money management advice. So, um, so for example, one of the um, uh, things that came out of the uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury's sort of you know war on Wonga thing, uh, I suppose you think we spoke about it, you know, when we were back in the um, giving this talk originally was was a, a set of um, uh, resources that that came out of, um, of Just Finance, which was an, a, a, uh, an organization which kind of emerged out of that initiative. Um, and they produced a, a set of materials called Lifesavers, which was uh, a, a kind of resource that schools could use to enable young children uh, to learn how to use money wisely. Um, now, one of the things I would love to see us do is to say all our church schools in London uh, should run that program to enable children in our, in our church schools to get good advice. So right from the very early days, they learn a little bit of how you manage money and how you manage it well. But I think it's absolutely right. It's, it's, it's something that churches um, should really look into, especially churches in area, areas of, of you know, where money management is tight and when there really is poverty, uh, where actually it's quite a difficult skill to manage small resources. That's something that churches can do much, much better than they can actually sort of, um, you know, lending money um, the way. And I think you're right, sometimes talking about money problems in church is a strange thing. And that can be often it, talking about difficulties in church can also kick in, you know, whatever it is, whether it's money problems, marriage problems, family problems, they can be difficult to talk about in church, which is slightly bizarre if you think about it, because church ought to be the first place you go to talk about those things. Um, so I absolutely agree. I think, uh, you know, that church is looking into um, those resources is, is really important. I mean, that may link in a little bit to the, um, uh, I think it's Elizabeth's question about how, you know, the rich knowing the poor, how do you build a relationship with those who are, who are poor in your area? If you're in a parish where you're a, there are pockets of poverty, but people in those areas don't tend to come to church very much, how do you begin to do that? And I think a large part of that is, is, is not assuming we know what the needs are, but then discovering what the needs are. Now that may mean going out of the comfort zone, actually creating opportunities for, um, for encounter with people. It may mean looking at some of the local authority statistics for an area to begin to, to understand what are the issues that people struggle with in this area. Is it money? Uh, is it housing? Uh, is it debt? Uh, is it food poverty? And what are those, those issues? And beginning to kind of realize what those are. And that may mean talking to local councillors who may well be a very good resource for knowing what the issues are in a local area. Um, you know, is it you know, teenage mental health issues? It could be all kinds of things that are the, the pressing needs of an area. And then as a church deciding we can't do everything, uh, no church can meet every social need. Um, and that's not the task of the church to do that. The ch you know, we are not the social services. We are not, um, you know, a kind of arm of the government. What we are called to do is to set up witnesses to the kingdom of God and to see, and so it's identify what is that need locally, and then what can we do as a, as a, as a community to, to help to meet that need? So if one of the issues is housing, for example, you know, how do we, you know, people keep struggling to pay their rent or, or unstable uh, tenancies, you know, a lot of churches have started to set up advice centers, um, getting people in who, you know, from either the local council or housing associations who are available to give people advice, creating a space where tenants can meet landlords or housing associations to get the kind of help they need to manage some of those housing issues. Um, if it's money problems using the, you know, the um, Christians Against Poverty course, you know, if it's marriage difficulties, it may be using some of the marriage courses that are around there. If it's um, to do with food, then a food bank might be the way to do it. So it's, it's getting that mentality that we can't do everything, but we can do something and finding out what that need is. And, and then making sure you do it not just as a program, but as a relationship building exercise. So not just putting up a food bank and just giving people food, but trying to build a relationship with the people who come to the food bank. T spending time to talk with them, getting to know them a little bit, finding out what are the issues behind them, behind those. So I think those are some of the things that can be done. Um, I mean, just coming on to, um, to, to, to Ben's question, which is a, um, which is a, it's a really sort of interesting one, uh, which is, and in, but in many ways, you know, you, you ask a question that's right at the heart of the New Testament, you know, because it's, you know, we're told to, you know, um, to lend expect, expecting nothing in return. In fact, it says we're to lend, you know, you, you lend your hedge trimmer and, don't be surprised if you don't get it back. Um, now, because we do expect to get it back, but you know, and, and normally that's what neighbours do. But that's the kind of you know um, mentality in the. Um, uh, and it's interesting. I suppose you know, what interested me in looking at St Basil and John Calvin on on usury 
um, both of them are drawing on that deep you know scriptural tradition that actually we should be willing to to, to give or to lend freely um, and Basil of course is very against you know lending at interest at all um, Calvin, I think, is in, is, is, is in a very interesting place. He's now, he's now in, a, in a world where, you know, you, you've got emerging capitalism, you've got um, entrepreneurial activity going on, you've got, you, you've got, you know, lending at interest happening, and he's trying to analyze that as a Christian. He's still pretty negative about it, interestingly enough, um, even though he sort of allows for some sort of redeemed, um, you know, usury. Um, he's still pretty negative about the practice, and he lays all kinds of hedges around it. And... Um, and I think one of the hedges he does lay around that is, is that you know, he, he sees the possibility that lending an interest can be of benefit to both, both parties. It can be a way for, you know, for someone who's looking to you know, start a new business or to set up a building to get access to capital and to enable them to do that. And for the person who's lending the money to, to, to in a sense, to, to use what they have to, um, to, to build resources so that they can then lend money to others in future. To, you know, and so, um, and one of the principles he, he, he lays out, I think, is that, that, that whatever arrangement is done in terms of lending at interest should be of benefit to both parties. So that to the person who's the borrower, uh, they're not out of pocket at the end of the day. They're given access to capital that enables them to set up a business, uh, to trade well, and to you know to 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 to, to contribute to society. Um, for the lender, uh, it enables them to grow capital to be able to be more generous in lending to others or to give others. And, but but you know the, the point being that the, the the approach you should take to the the the, the lending at interest is not how can I make money out of this person, but how can I help my neighbour. And if helping your neighbor means lending the money uh, to enable them to do something really useful with it, to, to build you know, their own sort of life and business, that's a good thing to do. Um, and uh, as a sort of, you know, as a, as, as a sort of building of relationship, if that means is a, uh, a small money that goes back the other way to en enable the, you know, the, the person who has the capital to be able to build their capital, to be able to be more generous to others, then that's works that way. So I think that's, that's kind of the way it works now. I, mean, I think when you read Calvin on usury, I think he would still be unhappy with an awful lot of what goes on under, under sort of money lending today, certainly. You know, and I think what we were, we were addressing originally was the, the phenomenon of loan sharks and the kind of vast rates of interest that have been charged. Um, and, um, really asking some serious questions about that you know which i think our christian tradition does raise about this around this suspicion about lending an interest so those are just some, some observations and thoughts on it thanks does anyone want to come back on any of that or um any follow-ups yes. alison do you think um bishop do you think in our churches people in with financial needs i think within the church um should be encouraged to come forward and make their needs known one chap that I'd lent to years ago, he reckoned there were probably lots of other people in similar position that hadn't made their needs, you know, hadn't made their needs known. So you can't bear a burden unless you know what the burden is. And on yeah. the other hand, should not well off people in the church be encouraged to make uh, uh, loans to, to people. The thing about lending is it does actually emphasize personal responsibility, doesn't it? It means that uh, in the first instance, at least, you're assuming that people should pay their own bills, but someone's they're not in a position to do so. So you lend the money, hopefully they'll be able to sort things out but in the end it might be turned to a gift of course if they can't uh, manage to return. Sure. yeah i've made them start lending on and on to some folks in the past who, who hadn't really adjusted their lifestyles I mean, that was a big mistake of my it's only when i look back i realized i was uh, I, I should have um yeah um, um, got to find out more about what they were doing with the money yeah that's another thing that's also others would be more more responsible that's a big question, isn't it? And, and, and Eileen, did you want to also? Uh, being married to a local councillor, I can thoroughly recommend going and talking to them about what goes on in your local area. Uh, and also, um, I went to the, uh, we support the Hanford and Fulham Food Bank, and I went to the food bank there. They're, they're very welcoming, they show you around, you can chat to people. That's a very good way of, of doing stuff. And also thinking about sharing money between parishes, that Elizabeth mentioned about it's you might be in a mixed parish but more wealthy people come to church um, without wanting to embarrass Ben I've been in two parishes where there's been a wealthy congregation and the thing that we I found most moving when we were working on stewardship which we call plan giving was Ben came and preached to us about what life in his parish is like and how different it is and um, you know there were people in tears at the end and I found that very moving and um, and the congregation did as well 
and it's all about sharing money between parishes rather than just you know trying to make sure that we're okay or lending to people locally both good points um, and chris would you want to come in and then we'll come back to bishop graham it just occurs to me somebody said something a minute ago there's a difference between lending when somebody needs money in order to um, create a business or get on their feet or, or that kind of thing and lending money when people don't have the capacity to repay uh, and one of the seems to me one of the great injustices of our current system is this idea that somebody who's um, uh, really low on poverty levels their washing machine breaks down they've got small children and they have to go through a system whereby yes you can have a washing machine but you have to pay it back out of your benefits which aren't enough anyway so there's, there seems to me to be a difference here where we're talking about the basics of getting by when people haven't got enough and in which case it seems to me that's much more a, a giving thing than a lending thing. But on the other hand, there is the kind of whole enabling people to take steps, you know, enabling somebody to, to buy a bicycle that is going to enable them to do a job um, and repay that. It's a different thing. Um, I'm not sure I can go any further with it than that, but it just... Good thoughts, it's yeah. really important that we're not it seems to me that we're really it's really important that we're not lending for things that actually are basics of life and people are going to stand no chance whatsoever of really paying that back because their in, income levels are so low um that that's why they need they're asking for help anyway absolutely i think yeah all those points bishop Graham, do you want have you got any thoughts on any of those yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I guess the first question about um, should we encourage people to share money problems in the church so that um, others can help with that? I mean, to try to create the environment in which that's possible, that would be a wonderful thing. It's not easy to do because, of course, it can be a, a, a sort of sign of shame sometimes to say, you know, well, I'm I am struggling with money, um, especially if in in our society we tend to think, you know, there's a kind of unspoken assumption sometimes that if you're poor it's your fault uh, and if you're rich it's because you're you've worked hard and you've deserved it mm. and um uh, and if you've um come across uh, um michael sandell's recent book he gave a lecture at theos i think last week uh, there's a very good little summary of it if you got on ted talk ted talks um he's written a book on meritocracy where he's basically pointing out that you know this 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 idea of a meritocracy where basically the successful uh, you know, should be you know pleased with themselves because we think you know if you've if you've succeeded you've deserved it you've you've worked hard um whereas if you if you're not if you're not successful if you're you know if you're poor then basically that's because you're you're a loser um that way of thinking is thoroughly destructive as a society and actually to be honest a lot of the time those who are wealthy are wealthy not because of their own effort but because of they've had all kinds of advantages in terms of upbringing and birth and education um, those who are poor are often poor, not necessarily because of their own fault, but because of, again, circumstances of birth and background and education. Not entirely so, but that's the case. And um, uh, now, I think what he's talking about is a, is a lot similar to sort of Christian understandings of, of, of grace and providence and so on, that doesn't see success as a sign of, you know, merit, that, you know, we're better than people if you've risen to the top of your profession than the people at the, the, the other end of it. And so therefore, um, you know, it's getting away from that idea. And I think if we, if we had a sense of, of our churches were more like the kingdom of God, where actually we sort of sense, well, actually, whether you're successful or not, whether you're rich or not, there's no, there's no credit involved in it. There's no merit involved in it. Um, that kind of environment might be able to make people a little bit freer to say, well, actually, I am struggling for money right now. There are ways of doing that to, make, to, say, you know, to be able to put the message out saying, look, um, and if you, if you are having money problems, you don't have to tell everybody, but here's someone who, who you can talk to. Uh, have someone who is available within that church that people can go to and say like i've got money problems at the moment and they can maybe put them in touch with uh, people who can, can can help and i certainly think within the church um 
And I think this is both something that both Basil and Calvin himself said, actually, within the church, we shouldn't be lending it an interest. We should actually be giving, either giving or, or lending without any expectation of anything back as we open up those kind of possibilities. Now, I mean, Eileen's point about um, uh, sharing money and sharing stories between churches is a really good point. I think very often uh, wealthy parishes can often make links with poorer parishes, and that can be a really mutually beneficial arrangement. And it's not just that the wealthy parish gives to the poor parish, because often poor parishes have a lot to teach wealthy parishes about community, uh, about um, mutual support. Uh, it can be a really mutually beneficial relationship. So I really would encourage those. And I think the sharing of stories is really important as well. I mean, a really good example of Ben, um, you know, from the, from, um, the White City, uh, visiting uh, Chiswick and just, just telling some stories of people. Because um, we need those stories shared around us. Uh, that's why our parish boundaries ought to be a little bit more porous um, so we develop relationships with each other uh, rather than in our sort of little silos. Um, I mean, Chris's point about, um, again, is a re really well-made point. Um, and I suppose it's about the situational nat nature of, of, of borrowing and lending. Uh, one of the problems of, of our system is that very often, you know, money is made available without any particular regard for the particular situation of the person borrowing it. Uh, whereas some of the, um, the sort of smaller uh, engagements, so, you know, we've got a comment in the, in the chat there about credit unions. And, you know, I think local, locally community-based mutuals or credit unions are a very good uh, model of providers who can, um, can who, you know, because they're small, they can build a relationship with the person and work out what is and isn't right. Um, and they're often able to lend to people on the margins of society because they haven't got to pay shareholders a dividend. Um, they've got a little bit more freedom to make those kind of decisions than, than you know, a, a business where they have got to pay, um, you know, to, to pay the dividend at the end of the day. So um, I, I think credit unions are, are, are absolutely the right kind of things that um, we could and should encourage um, people to get involved with. Uh, we're part of a credit union. You know, we um, uh, have some of our money invested in a credit union simply because we know it's going to be used to help um, poorer people to access loans who couldn't get, get stuff otherwise. But I think Chris is absolutely right. There's, you know, there's, there are parts of the, the lending business that are really iniquitous, uh, that are driving people more into poverty uh, by encouraging them to take out loans that they just can't, cannot repay on the kind of levels of poverty that they have. And the only way you can deal with that is by kind of, you know, by, by relationship, by knowing what this person can and cannot uh, take on in terms of loans if, they, if they're in financial trouble. But again, that's, that's somewhere where, you know, if the church is able to set up a, a money advice center and is known for that, um, then people in a local area, you know, how am I going to do this? You know, I, I've entered into this loan. I'm paying this vast good amount of interest. How do I get out of this? If they had somewhere to go and a church was able to say, you know, we've got a money de debt advice center. It's going to be there once a week. You can come in on a, on a, on a Tuesday. Well, whether you're allowed to do these days under COVID or not, is another question. But, you know, you can drop in. You can have a cup of tea. You can sort of talk to someone. You can actually talk face to face. You can explain your money problems and you get some help on it. There's a lot of tough time. People are just struggling in silence and um, not knowing how to deal with it. And a very, it can be very difficult to get out of habits of you know, spending over, over here because you don't want to appear poor. That's one of the dynamics. You, know, you want to appear that you're okay and you can provide for your kids and you can buy them holidays and toys and everything else. But actually, you know, the bills are not getting paid elsewhere and the problem gets worse. Mm. And so I think one of the ways we can do this is by you know, encouraging people to invest in credit unions, setting up the kind of debt advice centers uh, that offer that sort of help locally which can be really valuable. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, lots, lots there and like lots of practical things, I think, both on the, um, the personal level and on the church level. Um, and certainly, I think the thing that I took from the talk was really, if we're not relational about money, then we're not um, thinking about the best for all of us, rather than we're thinking more about profit. So the relational aspect is really huge, I think. Um, and Debbie's just mentioned, Debbie works at, uh, do you want to mention what you do? Yeah, yeah. so yeah, I am a debt manager. So I work for Christians Against Poverty. And oh, so um, with my church, I'm very, I can obviously stand up when we were in church and have a, a conversation about a client and, and their needs and, and that sort of stuff. And that, and that is very powerful. Uh, for the money course, it's changing a bit. But what I did, did find with the money course before is people would think oh I'm not that bad so I don't need help but really things like the money courses is actually preventative so that you don't get into that help so you know sort of doing this job has really been eye-opening but I think what's happened with COVID is people are talking about money more so they are coming for debt help and they are saying I need 
some help with debt and can you help me? So it is changing and I think that's, that's probably a good thing that people are not going their head in this sound mm. That's right and I think it's a, you know, it's just somewhere where we, with the church can perhaps be ahead of the game because I think you know financial problems are going to get it worse, not better. Uh, levels of unemployment are going to rise in future in the future, and the rent is not necessarily going to, going to go down. The cost of living is not necessarily going to go down. Um, so you know we are heading into a period where lots more people will be affected by poverty, yes. and that's where you know if churches plan ahead now and start putting in place you know can we can we run the money course? Can we get a debt advice centre? Yeah it'll be, be able to provide something which I think is going to be even in greater need in future than in the past. Um, one of our churches in the Kensington area here in London um, uh, runs a sort of, um, it's a kind of advice shop for a number of different things. So, you know, on a, on a, on a Wednesday afternoon, they have a food bank, um, but it's not just a food bank. It's also a place where they have, um, uh, they have um, money counsellors. So if you want, you know, debt advice, you can go and get advice on that. If you've got problems with your housing, you can go and visit. You, they get people in from the you know, local council, the housing department to give advice on, on housing. They've got the local police liaison officer is there. So if they've got a problem with, you know, antisocial neighbours, you can deal with it. So in other words, a lot of the sort of social services. And actually, it's really fascinating how the local, you know, the local council recognise a lot of the people they need to get to get access to, people who they don't tend to see, people are more vulnerable people. Um, who probably won't come to a council office and sit in a in a queue and and kind of wait to see someone with a ticket and that kind of thing, or rather kind of antiseptic and very distant. They would actually come to this food bank. They would actually come to the church where they can sit. They can sit you know, over a table, have a have a meal, have a cup of coffee. They can have a chat. And um, it's become a real real thing in that local area that if you want help on housing, money, um, uh, debt. Um, you know, family dynamics, you know, neighbored relationships, that's where you go. And it's brilliant. Um, and they've got a load of volunteers coming in. Uh, actually, during lockdown, their food bank has doubled in size. They've had a lot of volunteers from the local area who've been furloughed from their jobs saying, you know, I've got nothing to do. Can I come and help in your, in your, your one-stop shop? Um, and so it's been a great way to kind of reach out and share something of the love of God at the same time with people who've been part of it so that's the kind of thing i think we can be imaginative and if we can begin to set up those sort of things in advance of the the debt tsunami if that is what's coming yeah, yeah absolutely um, um i'm aware it's seven o'clock so if people need to leave um do feel free to head off so any people have other things on but if we're happy to stay for another five ten minutes graham is that right Bishop graham? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah yeah um just just before i'll come to our audience in a minute just to, to let you know on that because we are trying to equip the church we are we have got some sessions specifically on those areas that bishop Groves mentioned so if you're interested in looking at how we might start doing budgeting mon money management not necessarily being an advice center but just having some some skills to help people there's a session next week on that we've got various churches that are trying that and they'll share their experiences and um, whether that's a money course or that's just informal i can sit down and just go through your receipts and figure out what you've got coming in and going out and sometimes that's that's all people need um someone to sit with them as they think about it and then there's, there's another session next week as well which is looking at the more formal thing of setting up a debt center which i know that um eileen i think you have a, a debt advice in your parish um, and there's various and i know debbie runs one in, in cricklewood so um it is possible for churches to offer free debt advice and it is a, i mean we'll talk more on thursday about that but it's quite it's an extraordinary ministry that churches are growing in and it could be something that we could grow more in the in the diocese i think um, and the other thing just to mention is, um, I don't know if any of you've heard of Acts 435, which yeah. is a brilliant charity. Yeah. And, um, and again, it's a good way of I was talking. I was really struck by Bishop Graham's talk about should we be giving rather than lending? And Acts 435 is a great organization where you can um, partner with them. And as a church, you, you basically can give to people who have need, but also you can um, you can you can post requests so if someone comes to you and needs a little bit of money you post a request and it's crowdsourced by people all over the uk and then that money is given to you to help in relationship with giving it to them so i wonder whether if you're interested in finding out a bit more about that and how to become an acts 435 church we have a session on that as well and it's particularly i think i've had a lot of um, richer parishes say so this is a brilliant way we can go on the website and just hear here's someone who needs a fridge and i can give 20 pounds towards it i'll never meet them but i'll be able to do that and that'll bless them so um acts 435 session is on i'll, I'll send it details around afterwards but um but yes eileen just what oh, well i was going to mention that because um it's 435 was a charity set up by the former archbishop of york i think originally and i i just found out about it on social media or something but it's a brilliant thing and you can your church can join and then it's the um people within the church actually um have to interview whoever it is who wants money so these aren't just people 
just sending in random requests. There are people known to the individual church. And then if your church belongs, you can send in these requests. And then they do, we do, I just get an email once a month and it says, you know, uh, Mrs. Bloggs is desperate. She wants it. And she just, you know, if you just, she just needs a hundred quid for whatever it is. And then she'll be back on her feet again. And, you know, I think that's really good. And, um, and it's great and it's easy. You can either send money every month or whatever and just look at all the various um, thing, requests and see which ones you want to support. And quite often by the time I've gone on this email a couple of days later, they've all been met. So mm. it's really good. So a brilliant, a brilliant a sort of system. Um, quick question from Chris. Um, do you want to, um, just a, a point from Chris, do you want to uh, share that or do you want to read it out? Uh, I was just thinking about um, the whole thing about um, debt advice and people's nervousness about money. And it just occurs to me, some people prefer to speak to somebody who they know uh, and they've got a relationship with trust uh, of trust with, but other people wouldn't be seen dead talking to somebody they knew just in case something got out and actually somebody they don't know is what, what they value. Um, and the whole kind of um, 12 step program where people actually prefer to go out of their area so they don't meet somebody they know, but that kind of an anonymity built in and relationship built in might actually enable more people um, to access advice through a, a church step counselling centre. But it might be one way in which churches could could work together. Um, to have a sort of a go out of parish almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really so, good. Can I just mention it? Yeah. Yeah, just one thing I was going to say. So we, we're a debt centre, but we're also, we also do the Cat Money course and we do it online. And actually, I am a church member of my church, but there is somebody who is a Cat coach who is not a member of that church. And so both our phone numbers are put down for that, you know, so that you can speak to someone if you wanted to talk about it. Mm. Um, and it's also that educational thing about, you know, if, 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 if you want to speak to someone, there's someone here that you know, and if you want to speak to someone who, who you don't know and you just want to say that I'm struggling, then there's somebody who's completely separately, who you're never going to see on a Sunday morning on Zoom or anything, who you can speak to. So it's a great point. Absolutely. And I think there are also the importance of signposting that actually we're not expected to know everything about everything. But if you know, you know, someone you can signpost to who might not be known, that actually might work better than having all the expertise within you. So I know there's some some parishes are working together in Enfield to try and set up a debt centre. And there's going to be six churches, hopefully, or contributing financially. But also it means exactly what you said, Debbie, that they can be people who are going to train in different parishes. So you don't necessarily need to go within your parish to know you know to know someone but yeah good point Chris I think there's a there's a real um, shame isn't there around money and we and a privacy that we have to just work around um Bishop Graham should we I'm aware it's 10 past seven and we need to go and do things so would you we'd be able to just finish the um finish for us and uh sure yeah I mean just a maybe a final thought and then a prayer as we as we that would be wonderful yeah thank you yeah um I think I think what's um this reflection rings to us and you know particularly thinking about Basil and Sutton and Calvin and the way they they think about this practice you know we, we you know we, we hear that nervousness about lending money and how open to abuse it is as a, as a system you know we can see also yes there can be an argument for, for a kind of redeemed pattern of it but on, only as a only as an expression of neighbor love and I think that's that's what we're invited to in in this um, gospel if you, if you like that the practice of, of, of lending uh, at interest baptized in the gospel means a form of, of neighbor love and in when and this would be interesting to work this out and through our lending institutions but um, if, if lending can be and I think this is what Calvin tries to do he tries to kind of reimagine lending as a form of, of loving your neighbor how can I support my neighbor who wants to start a new business or who wants to get on their feet how can I use what I've been given the capital that I have to enable that to take place um, and uh, so it's reimagining our, our, our economy uh, in such a way that expresses love for neighbour. Um, and what I think both Basil and Calvin and the Gospel, you know, are working against is that sense of how can I get as much money as I can? How can I use my money to maximise my own capital for my own use? Um, but instead saying that whatever we've been given, whether that's capital, whether it's uh, property, whatever else it is, that's there to enable us to love our neighbour. Um, 
and that's what I think you know we, we are kind of being moved towards it's not you know we, we, we give generously um, but whatever we have whatever God has given us has given us for the good of ourselves but also for the good of our neighbor and that's the, the that's the kind of imagination we have to use. How can I use this for the good of my neighbor, my home, my property, my, my car, my possessions, because they're, they're a means God has given me uh, to support and, to, and, and to, um, to love my neighbor. So that I think is, um, will be a really interesting thing to do to kind of work through all our economic policies in the, in through that, that lens of well, what does it mean to love our neighbor with these things. So shall we, shall we pray as we um, come to the end and um, as we, towards the end of our evening. Father, we thank you for all the gifts that you pour upon us. There's gifts that we have received from your hand and we acknowledge that all that we possess is not ours by right or by deserving, but is a gift of grace. And so we pray that we may be generous in what we have been given. We pray that we may use our voice and our resources and our communities to bring support to those who are struggling with money. We pray for credit unions. We pray for those institutions dedicated to serving the poor. We pray for Christians Against Poverty. We pray for all those involved in this area. And we pray that as the Christian church in this land, we would be witnesses to your love, your grace and your mercy. We pray that more and more churches may be able to provide this kind of debt advice, helping people out of poverty to manage their money well, to be able to feed and to nourish their family, to be able to contribute to the society they're part of. As always, we thank you for all your good gifts to us. Help us to use them wisely for the love of our neighbour and to your glory. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Graham. It's really helpful and uh, really good to have some time to think about it. I think we are... Uh, mm -hmm. It feels at the moment that we're responding to a lot and it's nice to have a pause to think you know, why, why do we respond the way we do? So thank you so much for joining us. But just to say as Capital Mass, we, are, we exist to support and equip parishes across the diocese. So if this is an area you want to think of more, please do keep in touch. Let me know what we can do to support you um, on the journey that you're on in terms of um, helping those in our parishes who are struggling with money. So thank you very much all for joining us.